Our next speaker, though, will be Jane Skeeter, the CEO and founder of Ultraglass, and she'll be telling us how she changed the face of the architectural glass market. Jane? Great to be here. Thank you, Dr. Chain Levine, and your great TEDx College of the Canyons committee. Go Cougars! <laughs> this is taken at the Honolulu International Airport. It's a 250 foot long wall of molded glass with a molten lava theme. We installed that last year. So let me tell you my little story. Ever since I was a little kid, I was an artist, an engineer, and a compulsive entrepreneur. OK, so what's wrong with that? <laughs> I also loved a challenge. I knew that I had the ability and the drive to make anything with my hands. OK, what's wrong with that? Well, the challenge was focusing that, was channeling those, that ability. But it was only due to the fact of glass's fascinating and versatile uh, traits and characteristics that I've been able to maintain my fascination with it and passion for glass. And that's what I'm going to show you today. This is a section, a six by five foot section of that panel. I want to take you back to when I started. OK, as a kid, in the early 60s, we needed money to buy that must-have product, which was a transistor radio. It was really high tech, and I had to have one. And also, I had to buy material to make clothes, and I had to buy product to make all of crazy things that I had in my head. So what was I going to do? The options were either mowing lawns or babysitting, neither of which paid over 25 cents an hour or appealed to me. So I thought, OK, what am I going to do? Now, this was the Mad Men era, right? Crisply ironed shirts and dresses. And that was before permanent press. It was also the era in the early 60s, think of it, where the women were going back to work. And so who is going to iron? Me. <laughs> I put signs up in the laundromats, took in ironing. Before long, I was making a couple bucks an hour. Now, that was over the minimum wage at the time. So I was doing all right. I actually had to get my sister to help me. <laughs> Not, my parents weren't really happy about that. But this led, this was my first business, and it led on to many more. I couldn't help myself. So there is ironing. I started a clothing design and dressmaking business, partner in a Porsche restoration business. I did the interiors, classic Porsches, even a partner in a geodesic dome business, and was a, a sewing machine mechanic, and I did a lot of other things. I just couldn't stop. Also taught adult ed, colleges, various uh, things. But when I discovered stained glass, which was kind of the resurgence of the uh, uh, antiques at the time. It was like everything had stopped, stood still, because glass was a combination, of, or stained glass was a combination of architecture and art, both of which were really my passions. And so, like all my other hobbies, it turned into a business. And before long, we were doing all kinds of things. So there really is no glass ceiling. What glass ceiling? There's, we now turn glass into floors, to ceilings, and everything in between. And that's the only thing that's kept my focus on glass, on anything. I can't believe that I'm still um, doing it. So we did etch glass, one of our clients. Well, not many, but <laughs> um, it, it, we were doing work on a lot of big mansions. And I saw other glass trucks there, and I thought, well, if we're already here doing the decorative glass, we might as well do the showers and the mirror work. And so there grew out of uh, a whole glazing contracting business, and I got a couple contracting licenses in the meanwhile. But it quickly grew old uh, because of labor issues, 
stained glass was very labor intensive and a lot of drawbacks uh, with incoming um, competition in the market and problems getting paid from contractors. I decided that I wanted to stay with glass but be a manufacturer, bring everything in-house, control it, and not let the work go out until we got paid for it. This is another issue. So I introduced molded glass, slumped glass, also called cast glass today. And it was so much superior to the other products that uh, we had been selling and that were decorative. And as you can see, it works in all kinds of environments. We could ship it around the world. We made special molds that could be reused. It had a lot of advantages. Getty Center, and you've probably seen it if you've been in Las Vegas. We've worked in about every project there. Made signs out of it, painted it, cruise ships. So there's hardly an installation that can't use some form of designed glass. When I see products today, I think, oh, that could be made in glass. Glass there, glass everywhere. <laughs> Got glass on the brain. <laughs> Water features, sculpture. Maybe you've eaten there, but combinations of materials even cabinet doors, we can mold it. So glass actually can be very fluid once you warm it up, but it's tricky. And of course, it can be customized. Big murals, this is a combination of various uh, other multimedia. It has sound to it. It has a whole other story, which I don't have time for now, but it's quite fascinating. Showers, of course. And countertops, that's fairly new. Before that, what would you put in a bathroom area or a kitchen is granite. That's the expected, or stone, or some of the synthetics. But glass is a very beautiful and natural material, and actually also very hygienic. And a countertop like that, glass has greater compression strength than even steel. So it's stronger than most people realize. It was also the time by then, around the turn of the century, this last one, that uh, we wanted to add color, and tile was becoming very popular. So we started painting glass with the available materials, and even though the manufacturers of those products had promised us that it was going to be secure and permanent, it wasn't. And any time that there's failure with our products, no matter if it was the customer's fault or not, I'd wanted to change that. So we developed a technology of firing actual glass pigment into the back of the glass that rendered it permanent and that color. We first tried to make it opaque so you couldn't see the substrate under the glass. That was the challenge. We later realized that it's also great to have it be translucent. So we now make all kinds of tile flooring because we're making the molded glass. We could put texture on the surface, giving it a coefficient of friction so it wasn't slippery and didn't show the scratches and wear and tear. Um, you can see the combination of the carpet and the tile. And that has the permanent coloration on it, so it could be used outdoors, indoors, in wet areas without limitation. Behind uh, counters, as a counter, here you can see it. Bars, lighting, so the counter is opaque and the lighting is translucent. We can use various types. And here's something that was a real challenge. Uh, the designers and architects came to me. They had a client that had searched the world for a glass bar. And we designed this, and it's all molded. It has a texture on it and the fired-in color, which we figured out how to make all at one uh, firing. Some of the challenges on this, as you can see, this corner on the left, it's a 90-degree bend, and then it flares out and meets that top. That, to accomplish that with only gravity, is a major feat. This is the Jefferson Hotel in Washington, D.C. It's a historic hotel. I sometimes wonder, OK, what kind of deals are being made by our legislators at that bar? <laughs> it's also, I might add, very sensuous. So I won't talk about those other deals. Here you see some of the, <laughs> it is you walk into this room and you just, you have to touch the glass because it's very tactile. And doors, of course, painted, lighting. And this is where uh, we stretched, and actually these glass veins that represent palm fronds are in the J Japanese airline at the Honolulu airport. Things that you would never expect. Of course, balustrades, this gives you privacy as you're walking around with the skirt on, if you happen to have one. We can bend it. 
manipulate glass in such a way that is really unexpected. But we wanted to take it further. And you know me, not being able to stand still and wanting to stay with glass, we now laminate. So it required new equipment and materials, but we are able to sandwich not just a liner, which also makes it safety glass, which is how normal lamination is done, but we encapsulate all different kinds of materials. So this is actually a mica schist. And it makes it safe for staircases and flooring. We can actually print on the film, too, and encapsulate that. So much can be done with it. This is a, a fairly recent project done at Hilton Hawaiian Village. And these are great big, like, five foot by 10 foot panels um, of these big water drops. And we collaborate with the designers and the architects to make sure they're getting exactly what they want. But if you take a look at these areas that look like uh, fish scales, this is what they look like up close. That's called dichroic glass. Most of the time, you've seen jewelry made of dichroic glass. It has three different colorations on it. It's really beautiful and it's very expensive. It's about a dollar a square inch. So you can imagine the cost of these. We actually took them, cut them, and molded them to form these fish scales. Okay, one of my pet peeves, changing gears a little bit here, um, for years and years was seeing all the scrap glass just going into the trash can and going into um, landfill. Glass is safe, but it's a waste to have it go there. And it costs a lot of money to uh, truck it away, bring it back, fire it. So I have a patent on this. It's called Ultra Glass E. We may turn the glass into beach glass and then put it between grids, and it becomes all forms of building materials. So it can be, that's a water feature, but it also can be gates and walls, partitions and screens. It's very secure. Just another form, another way of keeping and diverting glass from landfill. It can earn up to almost three credits uh, for a um, LEED certified project. My newest, most exciting thing, product, is building integrated photovoltaic. Now, solar panels are great, and they have the right uh, you know, installation. They're perfect. But what about a tall building? How do you generate energy in a tall building with a very small footprint on the roof that competes with the air conditioning and the telecommunications that you have on top? What about all of that surface area? All of that surface area can actually be generating energy as well. Because building integrated photovoltaic, this actually an organic film sandwiched between glass, can generate energy in low light. It doesn't have to be at 90 degrees to the sun. And it can be used anywhere. It also makes a surface of a building. And it can be for the area that goes between the windows and actually also the windows. So here you can see it. Now, it's actually getting more clear. This was taken several years ago. Uh, there's new technology that's more productive and more transparent. I see it as the way of the future. There will be many, many opportunities for this particular technology to grow and to, to come of age, really. Buildings are great clad in glass. We all know that. But why not let it energize the surface? What about making balconies with it? So many opportunities for it that um, I'm very excited. So I hope if anything else you realize why I'm still so passionate about glass, how versatile it is, how durable it is, how functional it can be, and how beautiful it can be, how it enhances any kind of environment. So I leave you with a challenge today. And that is, you've seen what can be done with glass. And I'm sure there's a lot more road down this path for glass. But what about all those other common materials out there that we don't think about that maybe have second lives? They can be repurposed held back from landfill, that can stretch and be used in a lot of different ways. 
It's starting to happen. And that's what I leave you with. That's my challenge, and thank you very much.